Hi everybody, welcome to the Special Focus Recovery from Relapse meeting. My name is Rudy Q and today's date is the 24th of October 2023 and today I am absolutely delighted to welcome my friend Rick J. Rick came to OA in 1998 and he is from Kerry in North Carolina and after many years of moving around he's back there. So Rick, I am going to let it you take over now and share your experience, strength, and hope. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, and thank you for inviting me. And yeah, this, uh, this is amazing. I, I am so grateful to be here. And just, uh, you know, the meeting, Recovery from Relapse, you know, I, um, I was in denial that, that I had relapsed, actually. Um, and back in July 30th, um, you know, I, I had to, to come, you know, to, to a place of acceptance through honesty that, uh, you know, my food plan was no longer being um, strictly adhered to by me. And I was not being uh, honest about my food, but I kept justifying that by, uh, you know, well, at least I didn't get into the sugar. I didn't go, you know, just like face down in the food. But it was little chronic dishonesties that were building up over time. And, you know, I would hear people share about being rigorously honest and it would hit me right in the gut. And, and I knew that that was my higher power telling me that I needed to reset my abstinent date. Um, and so I did. And I, I came, you know, with all the people who I know and love and who know and love me, I, I just was entirely honest and transparent about it. And, uh, you know, and now I'm living in freedom. Um, I've, I came into OA. Did I say I'm, Rick J? I'm a recovered compulsive overeater? If I didn't, I apologize. Yeah, I am Rick J. And I am a compulsive overeater. Um, recovered today, but not cured. Okay. And um, I think it was Susie, you know, when she introduced herself, said, um, living in today's daily reprieve. And that's what I have is a daily reprieve. And, and I never want to forget that. Um, I, uh, I came to OA through the suggestion of, of, uh, of someone I was in. I'm in another 12 step program and have been since uh, 1987. Um, and I, I can look you in the eye and say, I have not had a drink in whatever it is now, 36 years. Um, but uh, I, I couldn't look you in the eye and say that I, I live in uh, spiritual transformation and practice these principles in all my affairs. So um, when I first found OA, I, I knew I was in the right place. I, I hadn't had a drink or a, a drug in quite some time, but um, I, I could not get out of, of the sugar. I started binge eating more and more. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I would counter the, the binges by, um, incredible bursts of, of, um, you know, commitment into the gym and, and working out and running and riding a bike and all these things. So, I, I would burn up a lot of calories, but I was overtaxing my heart. You know, I was just redlining my body all the time. Uh, you know, I was just like, I had a doctor tell me one time I was, you know, like a ticking time bomb and, um, you know, and that was true. Um, when I, when I finally started working the steps, uh, in, in through the big book, going through the big book with the sponsor, with the perspective of a compulsive eater, things begin to click for me. Um, and if I hadn't have gotten back into the food this uh, October 10th, it would have been four years for me in this, you know, in, in my current, in my last stage of abstinence. Um, other than that, I'd been bouncing in and out. I just didn't get it. I'd go to meetings and, and then I would leave and I would, I would be kind of confused about, you know, what I wanted to do with the tools, how that was going to help me. Um, you know, sponsoring people up to my level of experience wherever I was at. Um, and I just was stumble running. That's probably the best way I can describe it is I was running and, and 
and almost falling and trying to get my legs underneath me um, and, you know, just stumble running through recovery and, um, you know, picking up all kinds of different white chips, which is what we do here, you know, when you come back into the program. And, um, you know, I was like, how can I put down alcohol and drugs and, and I can't put down food for God's sake. Um, but, you know, it's, it's cunning, baffling and powerful. That's all I know is that I, I have a, an obsession of the mind and a physical allergy when it comes to certain ingredients. And I, I truly understand, embrace that about myself. I embrace it now. Um, there's just no doubt that, uh, you know, I, I am a compulsive eater and I will die a compulsive overeater, but I can live in recovery today. I can live in the daily reprieve today if I choose to do the spiritual actions. Um, so there's a line in how it works in the first paragraph and it's, it says the word honest or honesty, you know, three times. And, you know, when it's talking about the people who do not recover, and it's it's those people who cannot or will not completely give to themselves as a simple program, usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And then, you know, it tells what we need to do is like we need to grasp and develop a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. And those who can't recover or don't recover are naturally incapable of that. And then. We can recover if we have the capacity to be honest. That's why that the word honesty was just hitting me right in the gut. Here I am, you know, I'm sponsoring and, you know, and I've, I've had the gift of being, you know, sharing on different meetings in these past few years. And, um, you know, there's just a part of me that the ego part of me is like Rick J doesn't relapse, you know, like I'm some sort of, you know, entity that, I'm above and beyond that. Right. So what I would do is make a deal with my higher power. All right. Uh, God. So I know that I got off of, you know, my eating right now, but you've got this. I'm good. I don't really need to talk to my sponsor or anyone else about this. We'll just keep moving. And it might've been like where I had more portions than what I needed or, you know, something that I haven't struggled with in my food plan for a while, but I've had issues here and there, but I haven't struggled recently with it. So right now it's okay. Um, what happens though, is that, you know, when I do that, I get this mindset that where I will justify anything. And that is not being rigorously honest. Um, and it was starting to erode, you know, my spiritual connection immediately you know that process starts as soon as i start doing something that's this dishonest um my my spiritual makeup cannot handle that i'm not equipped to i'm just not so um now i am i am building a spiritual structure a, a spiritual home that i want to live in based on a foundation of rigorous honesty it has to begin there i cannot build a house on a foundation that will not support the weight. And if I'm dishonest, you know, it, it will not support the weight of, of trying to live a spiritual life. So I was living, you know, I would tell you, look you in the eye and say, yeah, I'm living in steps 10, 11, and 12. And I was doing my, you know, my nightly inventories and I was praying and meditating and pausing and working with others and trying to practice these principles and all my affairs. But it was just those those little words about rigorous honesty, you know, and, and my food that, you know, I, I was really trying to look at this bigger spiritual life and justify not being committed to a food plan. So, you know, in AA, there was no way in God's green earth I would call myself sober if I was taking oh, just one shot, just just one shot that's all i had and i didn't go on a binge no that's that's not sober and you know and not eating with a, a food plan as the guardrails you know of of my eating is is dishonest so 
That being said, I am back. I went through the steps with my sponsor, told my sponsees they needed to get new sponsors. And, you know, and that's the part that hurt me the worst. I, I was at work. And after I had this conversation with my my sponsees, I went into the bathroom and I just wept. I just wept. I That loss, that sense of loss and that connection was overwhelming to me. And, you know, it was for me, you know, it was I, I talked to people and I let them know where I was at. But it was something about making that call. And my sponsors certainly knew I told them. But when I told them they had to get another sponsor, uh, I, you know, no words can tell, you know, of the way that made me feel. And, um, you know, in, in God's world and, you know, and, and in much gratitude, uh, one of these sponsors is, is still wants to work with me and came back to me after I'd gone through the steps and we're continuing on and it's just a gift. I'm so, so grateful for that. And, uh, you know, and she's here with us today and, um, you know, recently I was at a um, a bunch of my uh, my my friends from my uh, other program. We every year in the Outer Banks we meet in October, and we we um, get this big, huge beach house. Believe it or not, it's twenty four bedrooms <laughs> right on the ocean front, and um, we all pitch in. And the off season rates make it you know where everybody pitches in for a week, and it's it's affordable. Um, and we, uh, we do this every year. And, um, the reason I'm bringing this up is I've had some, some, uh, relapse experiences there because this is, this is a week where, you know, you can imagine we would go to the store and, and, and when we go shopping, we would spend about a thousand dollars, you know, a pop, you know, providing food for, for all of us. And there's anything you could possibly want. Uh, and my first week there, I'd invited my OA sponsor to join me there. And uh, and the night before he came, I I relapsed. Someone was having an anniversary. A big slice of cake came by way. I took it and I just ate it. And then when my sponsor came, I had to tell him I'd relapsed the night before. And, um, you know, in this past week when I was there, I brought my my food. I brought uh, you know, and and there were people there that we we work with each other when we have like certain dietary needs. So we make alternate foods or or leave out ingredients so that whoever is is wanting to eat that they can eat safely. Um, and I'm I think there's one other compulsive overeater there too. Um, but you know, when I got back from this week, I just I realized what a beautiful week it was. I I was able to live and 100% rigorous honesty during this week. And it just made the whole experience so much better. What happens when, when I'm dishonest and I get into the food, what happens is a spiritual disconnect for me. And I'm no longer connected to my higher power in the way that I can be fully. It doesn't mean that my higher power just abandons me, but my connection to my higher power, it's like the way I think about it is, you know, well, certainly not now when we ha everything's digital, but back in the day of, you know, just the old radio, like, you know, the analog radio, you know, you, you got your dial and you've got your favorite station and you're right on that and you're listening to the, the music and it's coming through loud and clear. And then it gets a little bit off or staticky and, and you just go over there and you fine tune it and find that sweet signal again. And it's coming in loud and clear, right? And and that's how I feel about the way I need to stay connected to my higher power today is is keeping that sweet, clear signal on point. That's up to me. That signal's always there, but I'm the one who's got to find that signal. I have to do the actions that keep higher power. You know, it's um my my experience, strength, and hope comes from your experience, strength, and hope. This fellowship is so beautiful, but it's imperfect because we're imperfect. I need the perfection of the steps, and I need the fellowship, you know, and because without you, um, 
the big book and any other book would just be a wonderful self-help book that would eventually get put upon a shelf and start gathering dust. I need you to help bring this program to life. And I can look into your eyes and I can see your smile and hear your laughter. Uh, I can be out on a dance floor in L.A. with you. Um, you know, that's living in God's world. And when I say God, please, for anybody out there might be struggling with uh, a concept of, of God or a higher power, it's just a God in my understanding. And, and that's all I need. As long as that works for me, um, that's all we need. You know, God is we understood him. Um, and I, I just say God just because it's a lot um, easier. Um, a friend of mine and I um, were joking. I grew up Southern Baptist. He grew up Catholic. And we were we were talking about, you know, um, being recovering Catholic and recovering Baptist. But, you know, it's it's just kind of funny because I was talking about, you know, God for me being, you know, like a beautiful acronym for, you know, uh, gift of desperation, group of drunks good orderly direction, you know, and he was saying, oh, that's like the Holy Trinity, right? And for me, you know, that is, it's like my most beautiful journeys have begun, you know, with the gift of desperation. There's something about me that I want to change. This has got to stop. I've had enough. I mean, that's the beautiful place to be if you're going to start working a 12-step program. And I can't work a 12-step program of action if I'm still in my addiction. It just doesn't work. I have to put down the food and then start working the steps quickly with the sponsor who's recovered. And I have to go through the book and I have to get to that point where I've, I've released everything that's blocking me from my higher power. Uh, it's It really is this beautiful um, symbiotic relationship of release and connection. I have to release the things that are in me that block me from my higher power. You know, I've, I've heard that we're as sick as our secrets. And I also heard we're as sick as our stories. I've got a lot of stories up here, you know, and between my secrets and my stories, you know, there's too much static for me to hear that clear, sweet signal of my higher power. And being able to release that through four-step inventory, and then sharing it with another human being. Of course, God and myself are always there too. But I need you to hear that. That part of that humility for me to release that which is in me. And to be vulnerable. And to come to another human being with this. Created the power for me to have humility. and The power of a higher power. Uh, for me to be able to go forward in in, in a transformation and continue that process of release through step six and seven. And then ultimately through the eighth and ninth steps, when I'm looking at the harms I've done and I'm making amends for that, that's like the ultimate release. And that's why the, the culmination of the promises really start flooding in, you know, as we start working step nine, um, the promises start immediately, you know, and they come, a little bit here and there. It's not like we get a special delivery, you know, before we finished, you know, halfway through step nine, they, these promises start coming. We begin to have a, you know, a spiritual awakening and we start, you know, losing fear as we go through this process. And for me, I almost look at it like a fireworks display, you know, when, and then the, the grand finale, right. When I'm finally coming in and, and doing that ultimate release. And then I'm continuing this, this uh, release in, in step 10, you know, when I continue to look at myself um, and release anything that's going to be blocking me, but then I'm connecting. It's like, I love working step 11 along with step 10, because now as I release this, now I'm connecting, I can connect to my higher power more. I can truly see, or at least be more receptive and have the spiritual perspective of what God's will is for me. And then, ask the power to carry it out um, and then pausing throughout the day has been one of my favorite carry around tools and I have to work with people I have to give this away if I want to keep it but I was talking with someone recently about pausing and you know I have gotten in more trouble by not pausing you know it's almost well there used to be a commercial here in the U.S. where you know 
oh, I could have had a V8, you know, which I don't know if you have V8 in the, over there, but, you know, it's just a vegetable drink. You know, it's got eight different vegetables in it, and they call it a V8. <laughs> and I could have like, oh, I could have paused right there before I flipped that guy off going down the road. You know, I mean, I can pause all through the day as many times as I want. It can be anything. It can look like anything, just like with my prayer and meditation. It does not have to look like a certain thing. I have to don't I don't have to do it a certain way. The only wrong way for me to not work step 11 is to not work it at all. Uh, so I do have a group of people where we do our, uh, you know, our inventories with each other and we pause and um, I let people know um, what's going on with me. I can say a little prayer. And one of my favorite pause prayers now is, uh, God, thank you for this perfect moment to not be a perfect asshole. You know, that's one of my favorite little pause prayers uh, because I can be. I, you know, I, at my very core, I'm selfish. I'm dishonest. You know, I'm self-centered. It's all about me unless I'm doing the spiritual actions that release me from that and keep me connected to my higher power. The further away from myself that I go, the closer to you I can become, the closer to you I can become, the closer to God I feel. It's just this magic. Like somebody told me it's spiritual math, one plus one equal three. And, you know, two of us are together and God's there, right? We're speaking the language of the heart. Um, and that's what the fellowship gives me, the tools of the steps, the spiritual transformation that, that I go through. It's perfect. You know, I don't need to change anything in the steps, but I love that I can connect to you. Um, another perfectly imperfect human being, you know, because if, if we were perfect, there would be nothing for me to relate to. If I can relate to you, then I can identify and I can connect then, you know, that power of connection comes through relatability. So all I have to do is to be me. I don't have to be anybody else other than me. And the most beautiful people I've met in my life, you know, are people like Rita and Hillary and other people that I've, I've met in, in this, these rooms. And um, I just love that I can just show up, be me, but still work a spiritual program of action. It always has to come down to that. You know, I'm not cured. I do have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual connection. And, you know, that spiritual condition is spiritual connection. It really is for me. Um, you know, every day is a day. I try to carry the vision of God's will into all my activities to everyone. It's the people where, you know, I can get disconnected. So as soon as I am connected, and I, I do this in the morning, I have my, my little ritual, my routine where I can get connected to my higher power. And then throughout the day, I can keep that connection going. And I love it that I understand now more what, what can trigger me, what can disconnect me. Um, I, I am just getting over... Um, lymphoma i uh, i was diagnosed I, I found out that i had cancer the day before i flew to la for the birthday party and talk about you know a bittersweet experience i was so happy to see people it's the first time i'd ever been at a big gathering of readers anonymous and all these people i'd heard and been on zoom meetings with and on the phone with a lot of, you know including two of my sponsees were right there right there in person, giving them hugs. And it was just this amazing experience. And part of me was freaking out because I, uh, I, I found out that I had a tumor in the center of my head and one in right in my neck. And, uh, you know, and then who was there to share her experience, strength and hope with me, having gone through much more incredible uh, challenges than I ended up facing, but Rita was there, you know, so we don't, only share you know big book experience strength and hope we we share our real life experience strength and hope because we are we have a life worth living today and as uh one of my oa sister says life can get very lifey you know and i i was actually using some of my lifiness 
you know, to justify getting off my food plan a little bit, quite frankly, you know, uh, but here I am, here I sit, you know, recovery from relapse. It's, it's like, I'm so grateful to be living in this daily reprieve today. There's no gift greater. Um, I have, to my beautiful wife, my children, they're 23 and 20 years old now. Um, and Rita, I forgot to show up the pictures if you wanted to flash those up real quick. Um, five and minutes I'll just, left, Rick. Five minutes? Thank you. Oh, this is perfect. So, um, so here we are. This, uh, the upper left picture with the American flag behind me, I'm with my nephew. Uh, this is a period of time where um, I was about 70 pounds heavier than I am right now. And then here we are with my, my two children. I love this picture. I'm wearing a Krispy Kreme hat. The, uh, those in the U.S. know Krispy Kreme for sure. Um, it's, uh, it's just a, a donut place. You can go and, and they have donuts on, a, um, you know, on this production line these glazed donuts and it's like crack cocaine of the sugar world. You know, you just, when you order your donuts, they just take them right off the conveyor belt and put them in a box. And, you know, my kids would have maybe like one or two and we, you know, and out of the, the dozen that we would have, I would have the, the entire box eaten minus their three, you know, by the time we got home and I'd be covered, you know, in sugar and, you know, and Krispy Kreme flakes, you know, and grease all over me. Um, but I love that place. I, I went there a lot and they loved it because uh, we went to Krispy Kreme a lot. Um, and then, you know, this, you know, sitting there, this is like um, looking at my my face, this bloated face. You know, um, that's just the way I was. Right. Um, that's that's who I was. And I was sick. Uh, and I was really in a lot of emotional pain. Um, and going to the right, that's uh, at Halloween, which is coming up, the skeleton, I would strap to the back of my motorcycle. And I decided to do a selfie with, with my skeleton on the bike. Um, and then my daughter's graduation, that's my, uh, my, my daughter, Olivia, who also has, has an eating disorder and uh, has been in treatment for you know, about three different times in some psychiatric hospitals. Um, and after she went through all that, she, she was able to go back into high school. She, she had to drop out of her senior year after being accepted into three different colleges. Uh, she couldn't even graduate and she went back and graduated. And I'm so proud of her. She's still struggling, but you know, we're here for her. We love her. Uh, and she's on God's journey. Uh, my son, Jake is uh, a senior at, uh, you know, at uh, University of North Carolina in Wilmington down on the coast and my wife, Jennifer. And uh, and then that's me and uh, my motorcycle. I call him Billy. We have lots of adventures. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's these these uh, the second three, you know, images. It's, it's fully living in that, you know, that clear, sweet signal. Um, you know, God never left me, you know, but I wasn't able to connect and to truly appreciate what living in God's world really means. Uh, I was too much in my own world. And that's what happens. That's what it looks like to be living in, in my world is those other images uh, and living in God's world and living in freedom is what the, the uh, second half of those pictures to me represent. So, um, yeah, thank you, Rita. Um I just love that, you know, we all have our own story. We all have our own adventure. You know, I love like that line, you know, we were rocketed into, you know, a fourth dimension to which none of us, you know, had dreamed would exist, paraphrasing there, you know, and I think of myself, you know, like I, I want to be that, that rocket into the fourth dimension. Someone recently said that they were a relief seeking missile. And I love that. And so with your help One and left, working Rick. these actions, doing these actions, I'm, I'm rewiring that, you know, so I'm transforming that relief seeking missile into a fourth dimension rocket. 
you know, and a relief seeking missile is going to hit something and blow up. A fourth dimension rocket is going to be exploring these beautiful worlds, you know, and, uh, and that's where I want to be with you. And with that, I pass. All right, thank you so much. What an amazing message of strength and hope. I'm just going to read about a page 317 in the big book, just to finish off your talk. When I am willing to do the right thing, I'm rewarded with an inner peace no amount of liquor could ever provide. When I am unwilling to do the right thing, I become restless, irritable and discontent. It is always my choice. Through the 12 steps, I've been granted the gift of choice. I am no longer at the mercy of a disease. It tells me the only answer is to drink. If willingness is the key to unlock the gates of hell, it is action that opens these doors so that we may walk freely among the living. What a message of depth and weight, Rick. And I thank you for coming today. I'll just stop the recording.